Great. Thank you and welcome everybody to the fourth of five designer panel uh, interview sessions from the Fasten Off Yarn Along. My name is Anne Blaney. I go by Annie B. Knits, most places online. Um, and I am delighted to be the host today. We have four awesome designers. I'm really excited to uh, to get into this. So why don't I, I'm going to post their um, their names and URLs in the chat here on Zoom. And why don't I get you to go around in the circle? Maybe Bronwyn, do you want to start first? Sure. Um, hi, I'm Bronwyn Hahn, otherwise known as Bronwyn the Brave. And I live in Washington, Illinois in the United States. And do you want to tell us anything about what you design, what you um, do? <laughs> yeah, I, I mostly design um, small accessories. I like shawls. I like cowls. Basically anything besides sweaters, honestly. <laughs> I like toys too. Um, but anything that um, is small enough that I can just be done with it in a short amount of time, not that not that I don't drag out a shawl, but um, something that I can finish pretty quickly and without too much time going by. And I and I'm a tech editor too, and that's what I like to tech edit as well. I don't I don't edit sweaters if I can help it, but um, I like the short and sweet and be done. Awesome, uh, Duke of Nico. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Duke of Nico. I'm a knitwear designer based in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, but I'm originally from Japan and I like uh, designing uh, motifs and, and characters that are uh, of my cultural heritage, Japanese. So I, I love color work. Um, so my patterns are some are stranded knitting, some are uh, um, mosaic knitting, but uh, my favorite is double knitting. So I like uh, designing these little accessories that are double knit and double knit makes it reversible. So that's awesome. my, uh, my specialty. Awesome. Shanna. Hi, I'm uh, Shana, um, also known as Shana Lines Designs. I'm outside of Denver, Colorado in the United States. Um, I design knitting patterns and I use a lot of garter stitch and modular knitting. And I have a lot of things that are reversible or um, can be turned either inside out, um, whether they're accessories or um, garment pieces. Um, I. I think of my work as pretty beginner friendly um, and I hope it's really approachable to a lot of people. Um, and I actually work with Bronwyn, she's my tech editor. And so I was laughing when you said you don't like to do sweaters cause you've done a couple sweaters for me. I have. Um, yeah. So <laughs> are easy though. <laughs> right, right. So um, I make the things, um, they, I like to make things that solve a problem whether they're um, a design for me or someone um, in my family or a friend. Um, so yeah. Awesome. And Victoria. Hi, I'm Victoria. I go by Victoria Marks and Knits when I'm working. Um, in case you hadn't already noticed, I'm a fat knitter. I'm also an autistic knitter and I like to design things for people who have got brains and bodies like mine. Um, I primarily do garments now, uh, which started this year. And the interesting thing about what I do is that everything comes from having the goal of the pattern itself being as inclusive as it can possibly be. So when I'm designing a garment, it's not 12 sizes, it's 12 body sizes and 12 sleeve sizes. You can mix and match them together for 144 combinations to find the one that fits you. That's my thing. So it's the complete opposite of you, Bronwyn. I don't do little things. I do the huge tones that take forever. <laughs> but that, that's what makes me happy. And that's what I can do that maybe other people can't. I love it. And that your combination of the sleeve sizes and the body sizes is just brilliant. Um, 
I have so not. <laughs> I have not knit your patterns, uh, your your sweater patterns, but I have them all queued up and been. <laughs> My stash is right over here. So if I if I sort of stare off into space while any of you are talking, it's because I'm <laughs> eyeing up my stash and making plans. <laughs> so uh, the next question, and we we did um, we did ask the uh, the fasten off yarn along audience to submit questions that they wanted to have discussed here. So the the next question is what is your inspiration for patterns? And I know, Shana, you've said you're trying to solve a problem with patterns. Uh, Duke, you're, you're expressing cultural ideas with your patterns. Victoria, you're addressing accessibility and, and inclusivity. But do you start with yarn? Do you start with a problem? Do you start with an image where where do you even begin is where people want to know and what and how do you find your inspiration is also the hardest question to ask any designers so we're jumping in at the deep end um Bronwyn, over to you actually um I'm a, a really big word nerd um I I'm a tech editor right so I kind of have this split brain of math and English and creativity all in one. And so I find inspiration with words. So I have a list actually in my journal of two, three pages of words that I think would be really cool pattern design names. And I just need to find the time and gumption to, to start those designs. And I have um, like this pattern, uh, it's, a, it's a bandana cowl. And it's called Moxie. And the idea behind it is that I never saw myself as being able to pull off a bandana cowl because, you know, I'm not a cowboy, cowgirl at all. And um, so I just, I feel like with, with a bandana cowl, you just kind of can throw it on and look great no matter how, how it's positioned, you know, it's turned this way or that. And you just just you throw it on with moxie. So I just, I, I get behind the romance, the little description um, that's in your pattern and I kind of just go for it. And, and I, I'd like to tie in the elements of the design to those words and what, what those words evoke. Um, so I, I pull out my thesaurus and go to town. Awesome. Um, Duke, over to you. Yes, it's interesting Bronwyn uh, brings up words uh, because my inspiration is similar, but it's it's characters as in letters. So I don't know if any of your audience can read uh, Chinese characters or kanji. Uh, these are these are all uh, one word um, that I pick as a motif um, and. These are uh, characters are called kanji and comes from China, but Japanese people also use it. Um, so I pick a, a I pick one character, and one character usually means something. It's it's like an emoji. Um, uh, one uh, character, for example, this is T. So I created, uh, designed this uh, coaster uh, using the character T as a motif. And when I think of T, I think of green T, so I pick the color green. And so, so my design process starts from one character. Uh, but lately, um, you know, there, there, there's just uh, so many characters that I can choose. But lately, I started uh, choosing also uh, design motifs from uh, Japanese traditional, like architecture design or kimono design. So these shawls uh, don't have any characters, but they are uh, they started from a Japanese uh, design motif. Did, am I remembering right? Did I see you going around? Was it at Rhinebeck with a knitted QR code as well? 
Um, or is it a knitted I, sign? Yeah, I, I had this. Knitted, I love it. Knitted sign. So more more words and and letters happening as well. I love it. Yeah, and yeah. I'm glad you had that right there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. I had it uh, this prop ready for this. That's perfect opportunity. <laughs> That's perfect. Uh, and Shana, how about you? Oh, okay. Um, so my background is, uh, before knitwear design is in architecture and design education. And so um, the way that I approach architecture and design, I guess I'll back up and say, like, I've always been a designer and maker and creative person my whole life. And while knitting design is sort of a newer thing, I've, I've always enjoyed making things. And um, so I got into architecture because I like the idea of problem solving as it relates to space and how that relates to how you feel. Um, and then at some point in my knitting and my making, I realized that um, I could come up with a shape that allowed for a lot of flexibility and a lot of use um, and maximize uh, the materials, I guess. Because I think as architects, we think about like, there are standard sizes of products. And so you, you, you think about things in a way it's like, how can I put these together to um, use standard sizes of materials to make shapes? And so I, I came to um, getting into more knitting design um, sort of from my architectural background, my, uh, my son actually came up with what the first pattern is that I created, which is a cape. It's like a modular cape for kids and it comes with a coloring page. And so the idea is you could work with someone, um, your child, uh, someone else's, you know, a loved one, um, to help them, um, figure out how to envision it. And he sort of said to me, like, I want to have stripes and stripes, um, like in two different directions. And so I figured out and I worked through study models to figure out like, how does this work? So um, a lot of my pieces, I'm like looking around, there's like a whole mess of things that you can't see, which is fine um, because they're very messy. Um, so I'll work through something and I'll try it out for a while. So I guess when I was saying like, I'm working to solve a problem, it's thinking, um, how can I create something to meet this need? Sort of my architectural background. And then I test it. And then whether it's me testing it or someone else in my family or a friend get feedback and make tweaks to the design. And so um, it feels slow in a lot of ways, but it feels really authentic to me to kind of say like the patterns that I'm, that I finally decide to put out, like they feel like they, they're they like, I'm totally in them. Like they're, uh, um, they, they speak to me, I guess, in that way. I love it. I also happen to know that you are also a fan of uh, wordplay. From based on the names of some of oh, your patterns. Oh, yes, yes. I'm thinking um, number support. Mine are so kind awesome. of like, I make up my own words too, though, <laughs> which I think sometimes um, takes a minute. So like I, my first sort of big, um, and it's not a, it's not a garment that it's not a sweater, but it's a poncho. Um, and so it's a modular poncho and it's called Modulancho. So it's like the, the portmanteau <laughs> of those two words. Yep. And I have a vest that's called a rapazoid because the actual shape of it is a trapezoid, but it's a wrap. Um, and so I have a number of things that I get a kick out of the names of things. So um, I make myself laugh a lot of times when I come up with the names it. for certain things. So I love it. Now, Victoria, over to you. Okay. Well, it was really interesting listening to what everyone else was saying because so much of what you were saying was resonating with me as well. I've got a list of words that I think would be cool pattern names with things like Crawlix and Nivius and, you know, just you hear a word, you think it's cool, it goes on the list later, right? <laughs> um, but I think probably the thing that inspires me most that's not, you know, oh, that's a cool technique. How could I use that? Or this is a problem that I want to solve. How can I do that? The, the sort of the pure inspiration stuff comes from music and lyrics and poetry, which sounds awfully saccharine. <laughs> um, but that, that's the truth. That's, and I don't think I really understand the process where that turns into inspiration. It's more just sort of if I'm listening to music, certain parts will jump out to me and will make me feel a certain way. And I just sort of sit with it. 
and I, I like to turn ideas over in my head a lot and sort of see what falls out and where it goes. And somehow at the end, there's a missing pattern, you know, and so sometimes the link is quite obvious. There's, um, there's a poem that I really like by Nikita Gill, and it has a line in it that says, um, I've got it written down here as a note. It says, trees fall for both storms and the wind, leaving behind seeds and saplings so a version of them can grow again. And I, I just, that one line I love because, you know, the idea of something as huge and immovable as a tree can still be completely taken down. But there is a part of it that then lives on, you know, it, and it's the idea of things not destroying you, but completely reinventing who you are sometimes and that not necessarily being a bad thing. So that, that's something that I find very comforting and kind of inspirational. And that turned into one of my hat designs quite simply because the same day I read that poem for the first time, I'd seen a lace stitch pattern called branch lace and tree branch. They just instantly, within minutes, there was a hat in my head. <laughs> and a couple of hours later, there was a hat. I was going to say, how fast hand. do you knit? <laughs> Oh, not fast at all. I'm incredible. I'm a thrower and I know I'm very, very slow. <laughs> but the idea is sometimes they just come fully formed like that. Um, there's another line as well. It's in a system of a down song, just for, you know, poetry, metal. It's all mixed in my head. Um, the line is, we're one in the river and one again after the fall. And there's the motion of that and the, uh, there's, there's a cable design there that I haven't quite teased out yet. <laughs> but yeah, for me, music and lyrics and poetry. <laughs> Lovely, which is Lovely. also a word thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. Funny because isn't that I, this, is, this is our fourth panel and I haven't heard words as a source of inspiration mentioned in any of the other panels and then today it's all I love it I love it um all right so the next question and I love this question from our from our audience is what sorts of things what are your favorite things to design I know lots of you design all sorts of different things what are your favorite things to design and are those the same or different from the things that are your favorite things to make if you were just making for yourself? Um, and I love this question because it it gets at all sorts of the, the tensions around trying to sell designs and is this thing saleable? Is this, does it, is it going to go anywhere? Am I going to put a lot of work into it and it's just going to fall? But also it gets at a lot of why we do the things like we want to make things to share. So we'll go around the circle again with, with this one. Bronwyn, over to you. Um, I think I kind of waver. I go between shawls and cowls. Um, and they're, I would say I design what I like to make. So I don't know that there's a big difference between the two. Um, but I like to... I'm kind of like Shana in that I like to solve a problem or I, my, my, my brand is Bronwyn on the brave because I'm not afraid to figure things out. I'm not afraid of a challenge, at least in the knitting world <laughs> and, or crochet. I actually do a few crochet designs. Um, but I like to, to learn a new technique and I like, I don't want people to be afraid to knit one of my designs or to crochet one of my designs because they don't know how to do it. So I'll either figure out an easy way to do it or explain how to do something or just a new way to approach it. Um, so I kind of like that. Like I, I designed a shawl um, a year or two ago called Murmuration and it's, it's got a really, really big twisting cable design on it, but when I, when I finished it, it didn't, it wasn't wearable. And I was really frustrated because it's an asymmetrical triangle and I put it on and it's just, I couldn't put it on in the right way for it to actually show off the, the border. So I just cut off the corner 
and knit a new little triangle and added a buttonhole. And then the tail slips through the buttonhole and nobody knew until now that it was an afterthought. <laughs> so I solved the problem and I was I'm actually pretty proud of the fact that I figured it all out and it's and it all worked out nicely. So I'm just like little things like that, that even if nobody did know it, just like, okay, I worked really hard on this and it's totally awesome now. I love it. One of my very most worn knits, just because it's a really basic staple and goes with everything, is a cowl. But it's a cowl that started life as a shawl only it was a yarn that somebody had brought me from France and I could not possibly get any more of it. And I ran out. Oh. Yeah. And so I cut off one end and I grafted the two ends together and it's a cowl. Nice. <laughs> it just, it's like many loops around my neck, but that's fine. And it just sits and it goes and it's comfortable and, and nobody needs to know. Grafting drop stitches though, because it was a sort of a riff on a clipote grafting drop stitches was not fun don't recommend uh anyway duke over to you i like designing well i i, I like both designing and knitting one skein uh projects so mm -hmm. i like designing hats or cowls or, or or mittens uh anything that you can make within uh a single skein uh, because when I go yarn shopping and uh, and when I see yarn that I like, I'm usually uh, a bit of a chicken to commit to a sweater quantity. So I usually just buy one skein here, one skein there. And when I look at my stash and I see all those single skeins of yarns, uh, I it's it's kind of fun to be creative to uh, and and decide what can we make with this one skein or if it's a color walk uh, one skein each of this and this yeah. uh, so that's how I, I design and how I like the knit at the same time great uh Shana um yeah I definitely I I design either something that I want myself that I will wear and use or um, something that meets the need of like who my, my client is. And I guess what I mean by that is like, it's usually my husband or my son or the other two people. So um, I have some, I made my, my, my husband a hat a number of years ago and I looked and he was wearing it inside out and I was like, mm, all right. So um, I decided that when I design things for him, um, they will be completely reversible and they will look great on both sides. And so um, that's something that, um, it brings me joy to see things being used um, and to see things like that people actually enjoy what they make from my designs, from like the things I've thought of in my head. So um, I mentioned um, some of my, I have, two poncho designs um and they like they have and I have a like a vest this rapazoid vest and they can be styled in a lot of different ways so I like things that um knitting takes a long time crafting takes a long time and I like things that you can style in different ways um whether it's you know an inside outside style or like a front back style or like you flip it upside down and so um those are the things that I like making and I like wearing, or I like having other people in my, in my life, enjoy them as well. Um, whether, you know, it's my family that I've designed them for or myself or like friends of mine that I have in the knitting community, um, to see them, uh, enjoy the things that I've come up with and, uh, and choose to wear them or choose to use them is just like, um, a huge thing. So I, I, I have some designs of, of course, that I think probably many of us have that are, I'm kind of like looking at them, side-eyeing them over here that for whatever reason, like I, um, I made them, but they haven't become a pattern. It was like a thing that I had to do. I was like, I have to make this thing. And then I've looked at it and for whatever reason, um, it's either 
somehow like it, it doesn't feel like I want it badly enough, or I wonder, would anyone else like it? Or in some cases I have something that I was, I was working through that's like white and black and like two different sides. And like, it's really emotional. And I kind of, I made, I made two versions of it. And then I thought like, I just needed to make it, but I don't even know that I can talk to anyone about it. Right. Like, um, I don't know that anyone needs to know like the, the trial or the story. It was like just my personal thing. And then Linda's saying in the comments, my canned cranberry sauce, um, which this is, <laughs> this is ridiculous. Um, so this is like a little jellied cranberry sauce that nobody wants this, right? Like I wanted it, right? But I don't think anyone wants it. And um, even as I was making it, I was like, this is not, I liked, I, I should back up and say a lot of my things are like a looser gauge. Um, it's just what I like to make. It's what I like to wear. Um, and so this is a particularly tight gauge to make something stuffed. It has a lot of welts. Um, and I got through it and I was like, I don't think anyone wants it, but I, I just want this one thing, right? No, it wouldn't be too hard to write it, but it's, it's somehow right. So Linda, just reminded me that that's like I my funny it. thing that I yep. made. I would be so tempted to stuff that with something heavy and use it as a pattern weight for sewing because sewists always, always oh, need wow. heavy things to sort of pin out the paper and the fabric on the table. But, uh, but again, it is a very specific reference and, and a specific reference in specific parts of the world. And... Well, so that's why we sort of had the joke because Linda yeah. was telling me that like, this is not a Canadian thing, right? Like the jellied cranberry sauce, right? It is, but most of us would, would get it out of the can and kind of chop it up in the bowl. I've, I've never seen it like served as the, the oh. pristine well, can. Victoria, what do you think? Have you seen Ken Cranberry Jelly? I've seen it in that episode of The Simpsons yeah. where Bart's yeah. helping Marge in the kitchen and beyond that, no. <laughs> Here it comes in like a little glass jar and it, it's still ready made, but it's not like jelly. It's more like uh, yeah. jam, yeah. which, yeah. 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 I just okay. realized I think the worst possible words to describe that. <laughs> but that's like a cold bird. <laughs> yes. Um, Not like. Kathleen, uh, who who is also Canadian, <laughs> Kathleen is saying in the chat that she managed this year to get it right out of the can and unscathed into the serving bowl. So, yep, it's it's a thing. But I think the sound. <laughs> oh, the sound of it popping imagine. out of the can. <laughs> Yeah. No, just, there's nothing like it. Very vivid. But there was okay. like a satis but there's like a satisfaction I had to making this. Yeah. Absolutely. And, um, I was sort of, you know, people have really strong opinions about this food, right? And some people yeah. love it and some hate it. And it was sort of my own like, don't yuck my yum. Like if I if I yeah. like it, it's not really hurting you. And yeah. so by that token, it's like it's not a pattern. It's not going to be a pattern. Like it's just this thing that I had in my head and I wanted to make and it's done and it sits on my shelf. Yep. So. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Victoria, back, back around to you then. <laughs> I feel like I should say my favorite thing to design is bangers and mash at this point, which is the most British food I can think of off the top of my head. <laughs> but it's, it's not, it's not, it's garments. <laughs> um, <laughs> In, in case that wasn't already quite obvious. Um, but yeah, so with me, I kind of like all different techniques. I like lace, I like color work. I prefer stranded to intarsia. I don't do a lot of double knitting because I feel like it's very slow and I get impatient, but I, I'll try anything technique wise. Um, and really the, the most satisfying thing for me is that moment when you realize that of the three million different ideas and words and colors and textures and techniques and shapes running through your head, these five things click together and make something wonderful that no one else has quite done yet. And that fills a need that a knitter somewhere has. And it, it's, it's not necessarily, 
the the way it looks is particularly unique or the way it's done is unique but the combination of all of those things together makes it like nothing else out there you know and that there's that moment in the design process when you've been turning things over and thinking things through and you've got kind of I, I don't know if you other designers get this as well but I, I have this moment where I know sort of one element like I, I know it's a jumper not a cardigan or a sweater not a cardigan and I know it's a dark color and I know it's lace and I can't quite see it yet and then suddenly normally when I'm half asleep it just sort of pops and there it is and you know with complete certainty this is it this is the next idea this is what we're doing and then you start filling in the details you know maybe you already know the yarn maybe you need to go and find it maybe you know you're deciding on a neckline or all those little details come later and that's really anything that will give me that moment of clarity and knowing the problem has been solved that's that's what I'm chasing <laughs> but yeah that that mostly comes from garments um and mostly because one of the things I've been really enjoying doing for the last oh two and a half years now is thinking about construction methods more than sort of design elements and trying to sort of not so much turn them over in my head but give them a good shake and see what falls out and try and find different ways of doing them that gives the knitter some more flexibility so like the drop shoulder mix and match sizing I've worked out how to do that with circular yokes as well now and I'm trying to work out how to do either the same thing or a very similar thing um with raglans which everyone says raglans are easy to knit and they are but they are hard to design in a scalable fashion <laughs> and they are really hard to automate like with us you know have you all heard of sizing with spreadsheets yeah raglans they're impossible <laughs> or close to <laughs> and everyone thinks oh yeah raglan it's easy I'm like it is but it isn't <laughs> but i i'm working on it i'm trying to come up with kind of ways to reinvent the wheel because I feel like there might be some people who need not necessarily a square wheel but you know there are lots of different types of wheels out there there's wheels with tires maybe these people need some tires this train of thought is not prepared and I don't know exactly where I'm ending up here <laughs> but that, that's kind of the point and that's kind of my process is it's not I don't have a set path that I'm following. I'm not saying, okay, I like this stitch pattern and this texture and this scale, and we're going to put it in this construction method and this standard grading and boom, there's your jumper. It's examining every single step of how things are done and thinking, okay, this is how it's done. This is why it's done that way. And this is why it does or doesn't work for me. So this is how I'm going to do it differently. And when you get to that point where you've worked out how to do it differently and it clicks and you know you're there, that's that's what makes the whole thing worthwhile. <laughs> yeah, that's fabulous. All right. Um, I have two more questions for each of you, and then I do want to leave time for questions from the audience. So I'm going to roll these two questions together for you to think about. Um, one question is, how do you pick and, and decide on color combinations for your design or colors for your design? Um, which goes back to the inspiration thing for some of you. For some of you, maybe there's more conscious kind of color theory, especially for the color work patterns. Um, but that, how do you how do you approach color? Because I think that's something that, that scares a lot of people. Um, and the other thing is, what's coming next? What is what is percolating in your mind? What is brewing? What is maybe with your tech editor? <laughs> um, <laughs> what is what is coming next? What can folks expect to see from you in the next year or whatever time frame suits you? So back around the circle we go, Bronwyn. Okay, um, I don't do a whole lot with color work. Um, working with multiple yarns. Um, I did just create, not necessarily, well, I guess I designed, but I haven't written the pattern yet, um, a poncho that uses three colors um, and it's a slip stitch pattern. So um, that will be forthcoming sometime. 
Um, I don't have a whole lot of time to actually design um, because I help other designers um, get their designs out, but um, I do have that in the works. Um, but the color, I think it's usually just filling a gap in my wardrobe. Um, and that's really hard because I wear about the same colors. Like all of, all of my clothing is like the general jewel tones. So filling the gaps at this point in my knitting career is, is kind of hard to slice a rainbow. But um, so I can't really answer that all that well. But, but I think you did touch on something though that sometimes um, a particular design name calls for something in a certain color or something, a certain feel. Um, and kind of going back to the poetry thing that Victoria was mentioning, I have a, a shawl that's called Gathering Rosebuds and it was inspired by, so this was kind of like the flip side. I saw the stitch pattern first and it was a little rosebud and it made me think of gather ye rosebuds while ye may, the, you know, the ancient poem. <laughs> um, and so I kind of, and, but gather ye rosebuds is really difficult to say here's my new shawl pattern, gather ye rosebuds, it's just too much in your mouth. So gathering rosebuds is what I changed it to. But I couldn't just use, I don't know, a, a, I don't even know what color I wouldn't have used, like a garish, I don't know, orange of, you know, because roses don't generally come in orange. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I chose like a soft pink. Um, so that was, that's kind of like, I feel like if the pattern evokes a cer certain um, emotion or uh, a color feel, if that makes sense, then I kind of go along with that. Um, other times I just fill a gap in my wardrobe. Um, but to answer the second question, I have a collection of five shawls um, that are based on the five tenets of Taekwondo or Taekwondo, um, as some people say. My son, uh, he's 14 now. Um, and until the pandemic, he had been doing Taekwondo since he was five. Um, and then the pandemic happened and it kind of fell through. But, um, you know, it, every, um, every class that he went to, or not exactly every class, but they would talk about the five tenets of Taekwondo. And so I designed five shawls to go, go around that. And it's courtesy, integrity, perseverance. Um, what's the fourth one? Um, Self-control and indomitable spirit. So um, indomitable spirit, it sounds like something horrible and difficult that you'd have to overcome. So that in, involves a unique technique of dropping stitches. And it's like the worst thing in the world for a knitter to drop stitches, but I've got the solution for you. So that's in the works eventually. That sounds fascinating. Duke, how about you? Colors and future. Yeah, uh, we're all world people, so. <laughs> Uh, a lot of the words or the characters I pick uh, come from nature, like grass is green or river or water is blue. So a lot of a lot of the times the motif connotates um, the colors that I choose. And since I do a lot of color work, uh, the um, the thing that I care usually is the contrast. So for example, this, this one is green on green, but I pick dark green, a combination of dark green and light green so that the character pops up uh, when I do the color work. And this one, the motif is fire. Uh, so I picked, um, well, there's a lot of controversy in Japan <laughs> about what's the color of fire, yellow or orange? But to me, it's <laughs> yellow. <laughs> so I picked this yellow, gold, golden, yellow color. And I chose black as a, a contrasting color so that the yellow pops up. Um, uh, 
But anyway, uh, so the words bring up color a lot of the times. And what's coming up next is right now I'm frantically working to finish two garments um, that will be revealed sometime in February. Uh, I cannot talk too much about it <laughs> yet. Uh, but uh, after those two garments, I have no idea what's going to come. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right, right now, I'm laser focused on those two two garments. Are the two garments completely separate, or are they linked in some way? Like they're both coming out together, or they're separate pieces, but they're coming out together. So yeah, <laughs> intriguing, intriguing. Yes. All right, Shana, over to you. Okay, um, I. If I'm left on my own, like I pick black and white for everything. I'm wearing like a hundred percent black right now. Um, I'm looking down at what I'm wearing and I'm like, what? Um, and so I find that uh, I like, I have, okay. If I'm designing for myself, I know I'm going to be the one in the pictures. So I have to feel really good about it. And so I do a lot of black and white and gray. And then I have, so I just pulled a couple of things on my lap. So um this is, um, I'm just showing you part of it right now. So this is Recalibrate, um, which is a modular um, garter stitch top, but I'll, I'll put it on to show you the thing that um, is like fun to me. So it's like, you can't, like it's, it's white and gray. I mean, nuanced, but like white and gray, but then the side is yellow, right? So the side is like kind of fun and it's something yellow. And then I have, um, so this is Modulancho. This is, I'll take this one off. But um, this is a poncho that's, I mean, in my mind, like it had to be like black and gray. Um, that was somehow very important to me <laughs> um, when I made this. Um, but the style is such, I this is before like Zoom times and stuff, but I just remember thinking like, well, this is kind of cool. It's, it's, um, it's classy and um, it doesn't have a bright color, but then it has like a bright pop trim. And so it can also be styled um, like this. And so this was sort of my aha moment with some design and figuring out like that I could create a shape and something maybe for someone who has knit a lot of shawls and enjoys knitting shawls, but has the moment of like, how am I gonna wear the shawl? It's like, we can sort of move one little step if you're not quite ready for, um, if you're not quite ready for a, a full garment per se. Um, and so that's one of my designs, but then my other color, I, I would say is like this bright green. Oh, it's like not even showing up right. Um, it is bright. <laughs> so um, <laughs> this is again, like, so this is another version of that design. Um, and so this one uses a gradient set as well, um, kind of going down the side and then the gray. So if I'm left on my own, I pick, black, white, um, yellow, or like this bright green, like all the time. Um, I like to collaborate sometimes with yarn dyers and I try to figure out like, what is the perfect, maybe perfect as a harsh, is too, too much of a word. What is a great combination of like their style and my style? And how do I pick a color that speaks to both of us? I do like a lot of colors. I just think if I'm left on my own, black and white somehow makes a lot of sense to me. Um, so spoken like an architect, I know <laughs> I, right? I was like, as I look, um, so a couple of my friends sort of joke with me, I have sort of running jokes that I'm like, how many black dresses is too many, right? And they're like, you probably have enough. And I'm like, black pants, black dress, black top, like that is right. Sort of the, the stereotypical kind of architect wardrobe. It's like, that's what I have. And I like the knitwear for the pop of color. But um, yeah, it really is. And I think, um, and so what do I have? I'm sort of looking on the side. I've got a couple of hats right now that are in test knitting, our hats and a cowl. Um, I have a couple of fingerless mitts um, that are going. And then I've got some garment pieces that I just, um, I have been, I, I've been getting in my own way about them is basically the best way I can say is I've, I've been drawing them and sketching them and I have, um, I've got some stuff moving and then I just keep, uh, which I mean, I imagine this happens to a lot of us. I'm just second guessing myself. Um, and so I, uh, 
I, I'm hoping to um, commit to some things. I'm not great with like seasonality of things. I'll just admit it right here. Um, and so I feel like I'm, I need to think ahead a little bit more about some of the things to kind of hit the right, um, hit the right season. But um, I've got some other kind of modular pieces that I'm kicking around that I hope to, hope to commit to. Intriguing. And Victoria? Uh, well, color-wise, um, I like dark and moody, which is not the easiest thing to photograph when it's in it. <laughs> Um, so it, what, one of the things that I, I've actually been thinking about a lot this year, business-wise, is whether I want to limit myself to a particular color palette going forward or not. Um, and the answer is not. <laughs> but I, I was thinking about it because, you know, there's this, this pressure on designers that we have to have this beautifully curated Instagram feed and all of our samples must look wonderful next to each other. And I just, my brain does not allow me to do that. My brain is a magpie. It wants what it wants because it's shiny. And if I don't give it to it, it will start squawking and upsetting the neighbors. So I'm just going to keep picking whichever colors speak to me, whether that's for my yarn or my clothes or my hair or whatever else I feel like trying to tie on today. Um, but I, I think really what, is most important for me is what the color is going with so from when like you were saying some patterns need to be a certain color or there are certain colors they cannot be some patterns do need to be light or they're not going to show up some patterns need to be dark because the poetry behind the idea is dark and moody um so you know, it's, it's more about the combinations, even when it's only one color, because no design exists in a vacuum. It exists in the context of the inspiration and the initiatives who are going to make it and the lives they're living, and which is an enormous amount of pressure to put on a color. <laughs> but thankfully, <laughs> colors are very, very um, capable little things, and they can do a lot of heavy lifting for us. Um, in terms of what is coming next year, there is a lot. At the moment, I've got a pair of fingerless mitts in test, which are going to be coming out next month, if all goes well. Uh, the next thing going into test after that will be a child size garment, which is new for me, but there will be at least two of those in 2023. Um, on my needles, I have the next adult garment, which is um, a drop shoulder cardigan with mix and match sizing again, and it's all over lace this time because I like a challenge. <laughs> what else is coming? There's another pair of fingerless mitts at some point next year, but I think the, the biggest thing that's coming next year, other than more garments in more construction methods, um, is that the Fat Crafters Club, which I co-founded this year with my wonderful friend Kat, who is an amazing genius, and um, we are doing our first show at a yarn festival in March. So we will be there in person, which is terrifying and exciting. <laughs> and so I think because that's happening in March, that's coming up soon and it's new. So that's the thing that my brain is hyper focused on right now. The other thing, the patterns, the knitting is just knitting itself at this point. But the big scary show thing. <laughs> okay, two <laughs> questions. How do you get... <laughs> How do you get your knitting to knit itself? Because I think we'd all like to know that. <laughs> <laughs> and and two, tell us tell us more about the Fight Crafters Club. Oh well, um, the knitting doesn't knit itself, but it, I, once you get to a certain point in a pattern, you can kind of just keep knitting without your brain really needing to be involved. So it's sort of like your hands are knitting magically, and your brain is busy something else. Sometimes it's you know, working on the next design. Sometimes it's thinking about how you're going to write up a certain part of this pattern. Sometimes it's just sort of gone to the pub. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> um, yeah, so the Fat Crafters Club, that was um, an idea that Kat had. And I, I think a couple of weeks before she came to me with it, um, I said it kind of flippantly in an unserious way. And I, I think what I said was, I just want to round up all the fat knitters and put them together. And then Kat said to me, why don't we 
create a space where fat crafters of all kinds can share notes because there's so much that knitters can learn from sewing there's so much that sewists can learn from knitters knit and crochet are obviously very closely related and the thing that we all have in common is that we've all got fat bodies that the overwhelming majority of craft patterns do not serve they do not fit us they might not even go up to our size and if they do they're probably not going to work for our shape because one of the things that happens with bodies is the bigger the body is the more it can deviate from what the size chart thinks you're going to be <laughs> um, which is one of the problems I try and solve with you know my arms are like five inches bigger than the size chart says they are so nothing fits knitting doesn't stretch that much so um yeah so we got together and we rounded up some other fantastic mods and the five of us created a space on discord that's just for fat crafters and we all hang out there and we share tips and we share pictures of ourselves and what we've made and it's just a place where our needs can come first and we don't have to worry that that one troll with a big mouth is gonna take us down when we're feeling really good about something that we've made for ourselves. You know, so it's kind of, it's a place of emotional support as well as practical support. And the other arm of it that the mods do, and um, not the members, this is just something that the mods sign up to take on, is we run the Instagram account and there we try and serve everybody. So we share information about the needs of fat crafters, which can give perspective and information to other professionals in the industry or straight size allies, or maybe it's something that a fat crafter themselves hasn't realized. And now they're you know, better equipped to go out and make things for their bodies. So it's really just kind of scattergun approach of throw all the information out there and just really trying to make sure that everybody who wants to is supported and has the resources they need to make a best effort at making their own clothes. Because it is profoundly unfair that the people who can't go out and buy clothes have the steepest learning curves when it comes to making them. So that's something that we want to try and do our bit to address. That's fabulous. That's um, my sibling was for quite a long time, one of the editors of the Kirby Sewing Collective, and then went on to found, <laughs> yes, and then went on to found the Socialists, as in S E W Social, yeah. um, and so that and they make a huge proportion of my clothing. I make some of it. They make yep. most of it, um, which is just so liberating, so yeah, incredibly liberating. Bad. And so I, I. I super love that idea and that cause that that really gets to me all right I think we have gone around the circle all of the times with the pre-prepared questions we are getting late but there's nothing that says this can only be an hour unless anybody absolutely has to leave but I do want to open it up to the floor so if anybody in our audience has questions you can pop up your hands I see one from Amber uh, do you want to come on mic or do you want to put it in the chat? Hello. Um, so I'm trying to figure out how to word my question here. Um, but one thing um, I'm noticing about this panel, especially, um, is that you're all kind of breaking the status quo in, in the knit and crochet industry. And so I'm wondering, like, what your observations or experiences are as far as like you know kind of challenging those boundaries of stereotypes about you know who makes um and you know how things are done um so yeah i think that's my question thank you very much thank you amber does anybody especially want to jump in on that or shall we go back around the circle victoria go for it <laughs> I have opinions. I always have opinions. Um, and so does everybody on the internet. As soon as you say that you're doing something differently, you generally get one of three responses. The first response is cricket, which is because social media and algorithms suck. Uh, the second response is vehement disagreement, <laughs> which tends to come from 
sometimes disappointingly people who are really really good knitters like the people who have been here for decades who know how it's done sometimes the biggest pushback comes from people who are so well versed in what they're doing they can't always see that there is another way and maybe maybe they know something I don't which is why some of the things I try don't work out and maybe they're set in their ways and just don't want to change it's it's very very difficult um, but I think the most important thing that I need to do is to be very aware that I am doing things differently and to make sure that before I just run off with my idea I have to understand why everyone else has done it differently and why that's worked for so long because it's all very well reinventing the wheel but you don't want to end up with a square that doesn't work you have to understand why it's done the way it's done and then you have to make a really careful informed decision about whether that's right for this specific project or not because sometimes the way it's been done for decades is absolutely fine and sometimes it isn't and the important thing is not saying my way is better than your way you're a dinosaur get out the way the new kids are coming through it's in saying okay but your way doesn't serve this group of people and that's the group of people I'm serving right now and sometimes that's a very easy thing to say because I'm in the group of people <laughs> So, you know, when people say, well, you know, we follow the size charts because then people know exactly what to expect. I say, OK, but what I expect is something that doesn't fit. So that doesn't work for me. So I have to do it differently. So maybe there's a way I can do it differently where everybody still knows what to expect and nobody else is left out in order to include me. And if you can come up with that. It's amazing. And hopefully people can hear the whole story of why you're doing it differently. Um, but again, unfortunately, social media does mean that a lot gets missed. And a lot of the time people are responding to one tiny detail and not the whole picture. So it, it is a very big and difficult and nuanced conversation to keep having. Um, but it is also vital that we keep having it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anybody Anybody else want to jump in on that? I just, I just like showing up um, and show my face uh, because I think representation matters. So I like the, uh, well, I cannot say I like, but oftentimes I find myself uh, being the only Asian or the only male knitter or, you know, gay knitter. Uh, but I, I just like being, jumping into the world and uh, just uh, just being there makes makes a statement that uh, there's diversity in the community. So uh, by showing up, I I make my point across. Absolutely. Uh, anybody else, Shana? I... <laughs> oh, Victoria, Sorry, go ahead. I... I, I just realized that I said there are three reactions you get, and then I only explained two of them. So just very quickly, the third one is sometimes there's a pocket of people who say, oh, my God, finally. And those are the people you find them and you round them up and you get them on your newsletter <laughs> because those are your people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sorry, Shana. <laughs> Oh, not at all. No, I, this is great. I'm, I'm like, I looked at the clock a minute ago and I was like, no, let's keep going. <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> um, so I, I just want to say, I love this. I love this whole thing so far. And I love hearing from all of you and I'm, my mind is just going and going. Um, and it's interesting, Amber, your question, because I, I sort of, um, like, I, I never necessarily have viewed like my own approach to design as being something different, but then I get people commenting like, how did you think of that way to put it together? And I'm like, I can just see it. Like I can see it and it makes sense. But um, I guess I, I had a couple of thoughts. Like we can, I hope, a hope that I have is that we can all see and understand the value of like really thoughtful work, whether or not we want to make the thing ourselves. Um, 
I look at a lot of things that, you know, that do, unfortunately, maybe that I do see more than I want to see, like some, some designs and patterns that people just jump on and say, yes, yes, yes. And I think, I don't, I don't like it. And, and sometimes I can see, I like seeing it on different types of people and different types of color and different price points of yarn. Um, and, and that gives me a sense, oh, okay, cool. That is, um, that's something that I can appreciate, but I don't want it. Um, and, and so I guess I, I feel like I'm all over the place with this answer, but, um, I sort of, I hope that I, that I produce things and I share them in a way that makes, makes someone say, I think I would, I think I would want that, or I would want to try it. Um, I'm interested in getting into it. And I think my teaching background, I sort of, I, I bring, so it's design education. It's not like a, like a traditional maybe classroom education. So it's, it's people wanting to figure out how to create their own designs. And so those are the courses and the assignments that I've authored. And so I want to put it together in a way that somebody could follow the assignment and, and meet the rubric or that they understand where they can freestyle and still get a good grade. I guess if I put it in like the academic terms. So that's something that I'm really excited about in my own um, in my own work. So if I use a striping pattern, I'll tell someone like, I use the stripes like this, but do whatever you want. And I, I couldn't be more excited when people are like, oh, I did it different. I'm like, yay, that's so cool. Cause that's what you wanted. Um, and so I, when I, I guess I'm coming back to my uh, modulon show for just a minute, because when I came out with that pattern, a friend of mine who has a background in professional photography, she said, let me take your pictures. And I was like, Ooh, all right, let's do it. And we took pictures and I was so excited. And I told her, I said, I want it like this and like this in this alley. And like, I had this idea and, um, and I got some, some, some positive feedback. And then I actually got this weird negative feedback that, that a few people said, well, that, so I'm, I'm a straight size person and I probably wear one of the smaller sizes. And someone said, well, anything is going to look good on you. And I was well, it number one, no, um, no, but number two, like that, like I am the model and I'm making it for myself. So then it became really important to me early on to try to say, Hey, I want to show things on different people. And understand that like the the sh the shape that I'm making it suits me because it suits my style but maybe there's something the way I've put together that it suits other people as well and they don't look like me and so I've tried to um over the past maybe year and a half I've dedicated a section of my um website to other people <laughs> and sort of what they look like in my designs and I ask them like take take the kind of photo that you would like to see because I hear from people like um that they don't see themselves represented in photos of patterns I say cool help me <laughs> help me show my design on you and I and I don't say it in a way that I'm trying I hope this comes across I'm not trying to um like use people for free advertising. It's really not what I mean. I really mean like I'm trying to show similar, um, I'm trying to show a design on different types of people. So some people will choose to show me one inside and some are outside and they have different colors and they're different ages and um, different races. And I just, I'm trying to kind of in my little part of the the creative sphere to sort of share to show off to show off other people so i feel like it's you know i can come up with an idea but i i get so excited when other people have come up with their versions of my idea that i can share so it's i don't yeah i hope that's coming across in the right way that like i just i like to celebrate the makers i guess and i think it helps other people and so, um, and I've heard from other people like, oh, I saw this other, like you looked okay. Right. But then I saw this other person and I liked it better. And I'm like, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I, what I'm, what I'm getting here. And I love it when it happens with, I have very few published designs, but when it does happen, I love it so much is that by making designs that are customizable, personalizable, you know, custom fit or, or whatever, we're kind of enabling 
the maker to take on a designer role as well. They're not going to write and publish the pattern. They're not going to go through tech editing. They're not going to do all of those things, but they are going to take some of the, and I mean, any maker just by choosing colors and, and literally making it themselves, even if they bought a kit, it's going to be unique. But by by encouraging people to take that next step to choose the particular combination of sizes, to choose the particular way that they're going to use the stripes or where they're going to put the pop of color, the, the I love the underarm pop of color or whatever, um, you know, which motifs they're going to combine, how they're going to, going to see them. All of that is putting the design tools in the hands of the maker, which is, so empowering like it's such a cool thing I think um can, can I just add one more thing that yeah. Bronwyn actually helped me with with something um at some point that I like have your voice in my head saying this because I I had a pattern at one point um that it's a hat and I wanted to make it at like three gauges and like 15 sizes and like all of this stuff and I remember her kind of saying like but what's the gauge that you knitted at and like how did you design it and how do you envision it make it that. And I was like, oh, cool. Because people will always modify and people will always find these places. So I just have her voice in my head that's telling <laughs> me at the end of the day that like, I'm the one making this pattern. Right. And like anyone can do with it. Like if they, you know, they're purchasing a pattern, they're making it, they're using their own color, they're changing something about it. And like that, as you said, Anne, like that becomes their sort of like twist and spin but Bronwyn I just have your voice in my head that I'm just like, this <laughs> is how I designed it and it gives me like a yep. little sense of power like not not in like a crazy way but it gives me the sense of just like if every you know there there has to be there can't be unlimited variables right so whether it's like the gauge of the of the thing right um yes people will like adjust it maybe on purpose or not on purpose but um I don't know. It just stuck with me that I'm kind of like, oh, this is how I see it and how I want to do it. And so that that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, I mean, we're we're way over time here, but I'm loving this conversation. Um, I does is does anybody else from the audience have a burning question that you want to bring forward? Um, and if not, then I can stop the recording. Um, and leave the Zoom open, and as many of us who want to chat can chat, but then we're not obliging anybody to uh, to stay on if something is happening. <laughs> anybody from the audience? All good? All right, I'm going to stop the recording, so thank you all so much for this. It has been just such an energizing uh, conversation and applause from Kathleen here. I, this is exactly what we hoped that these sessions would be. Um, we will get this edited. Uh, thankfully, there were no Zoom bombers to edit out this time, so we can get it uh, posted up on, on YouTube <laughs> uh, soon. And uh, thank, just thank you all again, and thank you so much to the audience for being here as well. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Anne. Thank you.